Hello, everyone, and welcome to this session of uh, Working Smart, and uh, which is called uh, Work Smarter, Learn, Optimize, and Accelerate by Mark Limes and Scott Amler. And uh, without further delay, uh, over to you, Scott and Mark. Hi. Yeah. Uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, taking time out of your busy days to uh, come and hear us uh, hear us speak. So what we'd like to do is uh, share some uh, great ideas from uh, from Disman Angel and to introduce you to this idea that we can um, continually optimize, we can continually improve and do better and uh, become more competitive, become more effective in what we do. So uh, for those of you who uh, you know our organization, we work for uh, the Project Management Institute. And our, our focus is on helping people and organizations to work smarter, to helping you be successful in, uh, in your careers and to uh, become change makers. We're a, a not-for-profit and uh, that is wonderful. It enables us to focus on doing what we believe to, to truly help you um, rather than to try to sell you things. So uh, this is a very, uh, a very good situation for us to be in. So we really are here to, to share some great ideas and to, uh, to help you uh, do better and be more effective. So we've organized this talk into uh, three sections or three, you know, three themes, I guess you could say. So the first one is to learn, you know, how can we get better, um, you know, how can we get better skilled people, better skilled teams? Uh, as because as, as individuals, as teams, we really do want to supercharge our skills. We want to um, learn more skills. We want, to, we want to get better at what we do. Then we want to optimize. We want to you know, go beyond the frameworks and go beyond the methods and do what the successful organizations do. So how do we actually design our own way of working? Um, because we want to, you know, we want to be as effective as we can possibly be. And you don't do that by following somebody else's prescriptive techniques. Um, the frameworks and methods are often a good start, but they're not your ending point. And then how do we accelerate? How do we uh, improve our value streams, improve our flow of value to our customers or in the case of government agencies to the citizens that we serve? So how can we, how can we improve our flow? Um, how can we like really um, at the organization level, be agile, be lean, be more effective? So uh, an interesting question is, is, you know, are we there yet? Uh, Agile has been around for over 20 years now. We've heard a lot of great stories, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of great visions, but how well is it working after 20 years and, you know, many thousands of organizations adopting this stuff? Are we there? And the answer is no. <laughs> um, uh, maybe we're on the path to getting there, but we're not there yet. Uh, you know, one of the one of the great mysteries of the Agile community is, you know, why haven't we been as successful as we claimed we would be? You know, why don't we see every organization being, you know, truly Agile? And uh, the fact is, is that I think a lot of us are not on a good path at the present moment. So the Agile methods and frameworks, they're, they do help, you know, don't, don't get us wrong. So this is some stats from uh, Dr. Don Reifer, who earned his PhD in uh, answering the question, how effective is Agile in practice? And he, he still uh, has continued on with this study. And um, you know, he's you know, there's been good results, but nowhere near the magical numbers that we, we were promised and uh, continue to be promised actually. So why is, why is this happening? Um, it's because the, you know, the, the, the frameworks, the methods are, are overly simplistic. They're, they solve a certain problem uh, but that's it. So the, you know, when, when we have, you know, methods described in 13 pages and, and frankly, you know, the, you know these guides are, are great ideas, um, you know, a 13 page document is not going to get the job done, right? It's not going to cover all of your, all the challenges that you face and you need to look beyond what's, uh, you know, uh, what's in, you know, whatever it is you've been certified in. So, one of the challenges is you you can't buy enterprise agility. The you know everybody keeps looking for the the silver bullet to to slay the werewolf of their organizational challenges, and everybody looks for an easy answer. They want to have a you know just tell me what to do. You know, give me the eight magical steps that I need to follow to you know to transform my organization, or you know tell me what I what I need to buy. And the fact is, it's hard work. You've uh, 
you know, you've got to gain the skills and gain the improve your culture and you you really do need to do the hard work of improvement and uh, we'll, we'll walk you through what this is but uh, there are no easy answers uh, you know there really aren't so we need to learn to invest in our in our options we need to understand that we have options and we need to make choices and we need to learn to optimize and to to accelerate what we're doing and to to always be improving, to become what's called a learning organization. Uh, Peter Senge wrote about this, or Peter Senge wrote about this uh, 25, 30 years ago now. And uh, we really do need to do this. And the, and the organizations that are hyper-competitive that you know, we all admire and uh, we wish we were, you know, we were part of, uh, they, they're learning organizations. They improve constantly. And this is why they're as good as they are. So, so what's Dispin Agile? So Dispin Agile is a toolkit, it's not a framework. And that's, that's a huge difference. Um, and, and, and this is hard to, to grasp sometimes, but instead of telling you what to do, we tell you what to think about and we give you options and we walk you through the trade-offs of those options. So this enables you to make better decisions, to uh, choose the right way of working for you for the situation that you face. So that way you can have a fit for purpose tailored way of working. And as your situation changes, as you learn, as you get better, you can improve your way of working and you can, your, your process, your, your way of working um, can and should improve over time based on the new environment that you face. This is what a learning organization is all about. In Dispin Agile, we also support enterprise agility. Um, I think one of the challenges uh, now that many organizations face is how do you get agile out of the IT department? How do you... How do you, um, you know, bring it truly across your entire organization? And that means you need to re rethink a few things. So even though most people will point to the, the manifesto for agile software development as, you know, here's our mindset, here's what it means to be agile. Um, the reality is that even though the, the agile manifesto uh, is a fantastic piece of work, um, truly admirable, one of, probably one of the most important things um, in the software engineering field. And the fact is it's 20 years old. It, uh, it addressed the, the challenges of software development of 20 years ago. And frankly, we've solved most of those problems. Um, you know, we, we learned, we got better. Um, and our scope increased. It's not just about software development. It really is about the organization. So a few years ago, we stepped back and we asked the question, well, given what we know now, given what we've learned in almost 20 years, how would we rewrite the manifesto? How would we describe the, the mindset for enterprise agility. And we came up with this. So we capture the mindset as a collection of principles. So we believe in these principles. So we make promises both to ourselves and to the people that we work with. Here's how we're gonna behave. Here's how we're going to work. And then in order to fulfill these promises, we follow a collection of guidelines. And the idea is that we want to be, uh, it, the idea here is that this is what we need to do uh, to support true enterprise agility, to, to support um, agile, um, both within IT, but also without, with, you know, external to IT. Um, so, you, you know, I'm sure some of you are reading this now, you'll see that these are mostly lean um, ideas, a lot of great people oriented um, ideas as well. And of course, a few agile concepts sprinkled in, uh, because one of the things about the DA toolkit is it's not focused just on agile. We, it's a hybrid. And it, what it does is it, it captures agile strategies and lean strategies and even traditional strategies because there are some great ideas in the traditional community. And the, and the fact is we wanna do the best we can in the situation that we face. And sometimes that might be following a, a traditional strategy and, and we can choose to respect that. And we can choose to, to observe and respect the fact that um, ideas come, you know, strategies and ideas come from a wide range of sources, not just from the Agile community. So uh, we really want to be pragmatic in our approach. So the scope of Dispin Agile is the entire enterprise, all aspects, not just the IT stuff, not just the stuff that is easy to describe and to sell, but all of IT, uh, or all of the organization, I should say, not just IT. So the, the toolkit, uh, so these uh, hexes are something we call process blades or process areas, only one of which is software development, this financial delivery. Um, the rest is, well, not software development. Now, you know, there is just DevOps, so how do we address uh, DevOps in an enterprise class manner across the organization? But we also, to, we also extend that 
um, to support true value streams. And we'll talk about value streams in a few minutes. And then of course, the rest of the organization, you know, other supporting functions like finance and vendor management and, and other aspects. You know, uh, some people call this procurement, but uh, there's more to it than that, or people management, HR. So the idea is all aspects of our organization can evolve, can improve, can get better. And we need to work together. We need to collaborate with each other. So what is a good practice or you know, the best that I can do right now on my software team might contradict what the finance team is trying to do. So we need to work together to come to a solution of here's what we can do to collaborate more effectively together um, and may, you know, hopefully both of us learn and improve our own processes, but also improve the way that we collaborate. So we really need to look beyond our teams and beyond, uh, you know, beyond what our, whatever our focus is to um, you know, work together effectively across the organization. Um, and the fact is, is that these different areas um, have different priorities. They have different mindsets. So um, one of the concepts in the DA toolkit is we enable the, uh, we support where we extend the DA mindset with uh, philosophies um, or, and with um, other ways of thinking that are specific to finance, that are specific to um, product management, that are specific to data management and so on that reflect the reality of those process blades of those process areas. Um, because we, we need to understand if we wanna collaborate effectively with the HR folks, we need to understand where they're coming from. We need to understand their unique mindset and appreciate it, respect it. And uh, that way that will enable us to understand them better. And similarly, they need to understand what we're all about, uh, you know, whatever team I'm on. And, uh, and so that way they can inter interact effectively with us. So the toolkit is flexible. It reflects reality. It, it's, it's not, you know, what, you know, this mystical fanc fanciful idea of how things should work, but it reflects the reality of how things actually work. Um, and that I think is critical. So how do we learn? You know, how do we go about supercharging our skills? So actually, Mark, do you want to do you want to uh, you want to take this slide? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Scott. So um, as as Scott mentioned, the, the the a lot of agile is described by pretty small bodies of knowledge, and and Scrum is an example. Its body of knowledge is the Scrum Guide, and and it's thirteen pages, and and that's that's wonderful. It's it's a it, it's a jewel. It's a a nice kernel of process, if you will, but it simply isn't enough. And by design, Ken and Jeff designed Scrum as such and said, we're not going to try to tell you how to do estimating or architecture or um, other aspects of solution delivery. You, you're going to have to figure that out yourself. <laughs> and that's nice and, and that's noble, but a lot of people give at, with a, absent that body of knowledge struggle uh, to figure things out themselves. And what Scott and I and others have done is we've done the heavy lifting. We've, we've collected the practices from the hundred books and brought them together into one toolkit so that you don't have to try to figure things out yourself. And that is what the Choose Your Wow book, book is all about. It's a very significant body of knowledge and where you might learn one type of estimating in a scrum course uh, using points or something like that. We have nine different strategies because we believe that choice is good and context counts. Uh, but it's, it's nice to be, um, to be able to have a reference to help you to be successful rather than um, you know, failing fast over and over again until you finally figure things out. So um, we, we believe that an investment in learning all these strategies and at last count, it was over 1600 techniques in our toolkit. Uh, but by, le by learning these strategies, you're gonna be more effective I, th I think it's the message here, Scott. Yeah, definitely. Thanks. So, yes, yeah, so, and so choice is good. So when you go to the market, you've got choices. And, and I would argue that the reason why events like Agile India exist is to share ideas, to, to tell you, to, to teach you that you have options, that there are other ways of working that, you know, go beyond what you might have learned in a, in a certification workshop or, in, you know, whatever training you received, if any. So, um, and you need to understand what these choices are. So just like when you go to make your dinner tonight, you you know you put together the ingredients to make your meal. You need to understand that you know what these you know what these things taste like, how to work with them, how they, how they fit together, right? So you know I, I would hope that you wouldn't get vinegar and vanilla ice cream and try to make dinner out of that. 
Um, well, maybe you can, but uh, gut feel tells me it's not going to work out well. So um, you, you really need to have some knowledge. You really need to understand and you need to understand, you know, what, what mood am I in tonight? You know, what, what do I feel like eating uh, this evening? So the DA toolkit help, gives you these options and they, it puts these options into, into context for you. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll see some examples of this in a few minutes, but um, you have choices and how do you choose, then the issue becomes, how do you choose the right strategy for you in the situation that you face? Um, because there's no such thing as a best practice. That's this wonderful marketing rhetoric. But the reality is, is that any given practice, any given strategy works well in some situations and is a bad idea in others. So it's a best practice for you in your context, perhaps. Um, but just because something works for you right now doesn't mean it's a good idea for the team down the hall from you. Or it doesn't mean it's a good idea for you six months from now when you face a different situation. You've got to use the right strategy for the situation you face. Another thing that we do in Dispin Agile is we recognize the fact that diff you know, different teams will work in different ways. And that means you need different life cycles. So, you know, for those of you who have been around for a while, you, you probably remember the, you know, the Scrum versus Kanban debate. Um, and this was a raging fight. Um, you know, 10 years ago, and it still it still sort of occurs. There's like, you know, the occasional brush fire, um, you know, of which, which way to go. And the reality is, is uh, they're both great. And you want to do, you know, use the right strategy in the right situation. So we support multiple life cycles. We support a, a scrum-based agile project life cycle because projects still exist. Uh, we support an agile scrum-based continuous or service team or long-standing team life cycles. And I'm sure in, our, in your organizations, you've got teams that are doing all of these, you know, you've got teams that are doing all these sorts of things. We also support a, an exploratory um, uh, hypothesis-driven life cycle based on lean startup for, you know, uh, running experiments in the marketplace and, you know, creating MVPs, seeing what your customers want. And of course, a program uh, team of teams type of a life cycle, you know, very similar to uh, less um, in many ways. So the idea is, depending on your situation, your team will pick a life cycle to start with. And it's like, it's like, a, it's like the glue that holds the practices together or like recipes that um, hold the ingredients together to help you make a great meal. Um, but they're only a starting point. Like for those of you who do the cooking at home, you know that even if you have a recipe for a certain dish, you probably fiddle with it. You probably change it for, you know, based on your experience, based on the, the tastes of, you know, the desires of what your family likes to eat. Now, you've probably and Scott, I, one thing I want to point out too, is that you may have heard there's a huge movement, certainly in the IT area from project to product. In fact, there's a very good book about this by Mick Kirsten. Um, and certainly in, in, in many situations, organizing long-term teams aligned to business areas or value streams, similar to what a, a product company would use, is a good way to go. Um, but, you know, Scott and I have said for many years that one flavor doesn't fit everybody. So the fact, when you hear the, you know, on the stage, the projects are dead and everything is products, that's just simply not true. It is rhetoric. Uh, I was just actually speaking with a, a consulting firm yesterday that deals in projects. They get brought in by customer to, to deliver something and then leave. <laughs> that is not a product. And, and so I would just encourage you all to keep an open mind. To, and, and this is one of the great things about Disciplined Agile is we support all kinds of approaches. So if you want to use a project approach, that's fine. If you want to use a more long-term product approach, that is also fine. So that's one thing you'll see about the, the DA toolkit is we're very, very flexible in that regard. Thanks, Scott. Yeah, definitely. And, and what's also interesting is that um, your organization probably has this underway already or something very, very close to this, um, but you still need to govern it. You still need to lead these teams. And, um, you know, if, if from, this is from the point of view of an executive now. Um, so Dispin Agile includes explicit governance strategies. You know, governance is not a swear word 
in, in Dispan Agile. You are being governed and you deserve to be governed well. So we include explicit strategies for governance um, to provide the guidance that your executives need to, for them to do their jobs effectively too. Um, so this is a, a very healthy and, and uh, important uh, aspect of uh, the DA toolkit. So Dispan Agile provides you the choices. This, is, this diagram is called a goal, di uh, process goal diagram. And what it does is it summarizes the, you know, the choices. It's basically a checklist when, you, when it gets down to it. Um, so the way you read this diagram is, the, so this is for the explore scope process goal. There's, uh, I believe 20, if my count is right, there's 26 process goals describing team agility. Um, one of which is, you know, how do we explore scope? How do we understand the requirements that we're um, supposed to be uh, uh, addressing? And when you explore requirements, when you explore the scope, there are several uh, decision points that you need to make. There are several issues that you need to consider. So how are we going to explore the purpose of what we're producing? How are we going to explore usage? How are we going to understand how our potential customers or end users are going to work with our product or our service, whatever it is that we're, we're producing? How are we going to explore the data stuff? How are we going to explore the business process? And so on. The, so instead of telling you what to do, we give you choices. So in Dispan Agile, and so to the right of the decision points are option lists. Now we're not saying we've identified every possible option on the planet, but we are saying we've you know, we've we've identified a, a a good a good set of choices enough to let you know you do have choices, and we're and we're constantly um, you know evolving the toolkit itself and constantly adding adding and uh, adding new things and updating things. Um, and there's two types of lists here. There's an an ordered list the list with an arrow beside them. And what that indicates is that the strategies towards the top of the list are generally more effective than the strategies towards the bottom of the list. So in that way, it's sort of a maturity model. Uh, but there's also unordered lists you know, without arrows. And what we're saying there is that even though we can tell you the trade-offs associated with these techniques, we can't really you know, say, you know, this is generally better than this. Um, all we can do is say, yeah, here's the advantage and disadvantage of this one. Here's the advantage and disadvantage of that one. You choose whatever is right for you for your situation. Now, usually at this point, I, I show these sorts of diagrams to people and they tend to get overwhelmed. It's like, oh my God, what do you mean? I've got all these choices to make. Um, yeah, this is, this is reality and, and you effectively are making them or they're being made for you. It's just like when you go to the, to the market for shopping for food, there's thousands of ingredients, potential ingredients there, and you're you're choosing the subset that's right for you for you know the the coming few days or you know week or so um, for your family. Uh, so it's the same same sort of thing on the on the process side of things. Now compare this to methods or to frameworks, and what they do is they effectively redact your choices. They say, well, these techniques are the you know, you know, these are the best practices for you in our method and, you know, you do this and otherwise you're, you know, you're doing something else, not this, and you're, you're a bad person for not following our advice. Um, and there's great religious battles uh, in the community about these sorts of things. But the reality is, is that, you know, we do have choices. And like I said earlier, the reason why conferences like this exist is to, you know, to share other techniques that you might not be aware of with you. Um, this is reality. So let's embrace reality. Um, let's start, re, you know, let's, reje let's reject the redaction <laughs> that we're being given. Now, to be fair, you, you do, you know, if you're brand new to cooking, you don't want to have to go to the market and, and figure things out on your own. You do sort of want to have a recipe and you do want to have a starting point. And so fair enough. And the, the methods and frameworks are great starting points, um, but they're not your ending point. You got to get to the, you got to get to the point where you're, you're making choices for yourself. So yes, Scott, if I could just add to that, I mean, um, you're right. When I when I tell people there's 1,600 practices in the toolkit, they go, "Oh, I can't possibly deal with that." Um, I'm I'm here to tell you, it's not that hard. It's a reference. It's not you don't do all this stuff, but when you're looking for help to supplement these little things that Scott has shown here, um, a, a lot of people are blissfully ignorant about supplemental techniques and that can help them to be more effective. And you know, Scott and I have been out there helping clients for literally decades and teaching uh, these different techniques to people. So we kind of have this up in our head. We have that luxury. A lot of people just simply don't know what their options are. It goes back to the pantry of ingredients and the marketplace of ingredients. 
So our, our fundamental value proposition is uh, what, what makes a good consultant? A good consultant is somebody who knows what the options are and knows which ones work in different kinds of situations. Using the DA toolkit, you can really up your game because you'll learn things, I promise you, you've never even heard of before that it's gonna make you more effective with your organization and if you're a consultant with your clients. So that's what we're trying to say is invest in learning what your options are and you're gonna be, you and your team and your organization are gonna be far more effective. Yes, yes definitely, thank you. So yeah, so the, the gold diagrams are your pantry and the life cycles are your starter recipes. So um, think of it like that. So how do we optimize? How do we get better? So instead of, yeah, so one, one thing I would suggest is that why don't we look at the apex level competitors? Why don't we look at the organizations that we truly admire? Well, you know, that's the Amazons, the Alibabas, the, you know, the Spotify's of the world. What are they doing? Um, you know, why did they get, you know, why are they as good as they are? You know, are they copying somebody else's approach, adopting these frameworks, or are they evolving their own ways of working? Well, we know they're evolving their own ways of working. They, they would laugh at you if you suggested to adopt these methods or frameworks. So they enjoy improvement curves that look like this. They just continuously improve over time. Um, there's nothing special about Amazon or Alibaba other than the fact they, they choose to improve constantly. Um, and they, they've been doing it for so long. That's why they're so much better than the rest of us is they've just been improving and, and they've gotten ahead. So what do they do? So they, they take an approach called continuous improvement. So they identify the problems. They, actually, I'll get rid of that. Um, they realize they got an issue. They realize they've got something to improve. So they identify potential ways to improve. It, to improve. They try them out in practice. They experiment. They assess um, the effectiveness of that technique and they adopt what works and they abandon what doesn't work. And then if they're polite, they share their learnings with others. And then they rinse and repeat, they continue on. So what actually happens? Well, they run an experiment, they fail, but at least they fail fast, right? So there's all this rhetoric around failing fast and certainly failing fast is better than failing slowly. So they try again and they fail again. And they try again and they fail again. They try again and eventually they succeed. They have, a, they have a, a successful experiment. So then they adopt that and then they continue on. So this is the way that things work. Now, this is okay for them. When you're on the leading edge and you truly are experimenting with, with new strategies that nobody else has ever dealt with before, um, then yeah, you're gonna have a lot of failures. But if you're not a leading edge firm, if you are behind and you know, fair enough, maybe you don't need to have as many failures. Maybe we could be smarter about this, a lot smarter about this. So maybe failing fast isn't the brightest thing to be doing. So how can we improve? Well, one challenge is that some of our experiments fail and you're only human, some experiments are gonna fail. And, you know, if you fail fast, that's a good thing. Far better than failing slowly. But you know what? Maybe we could succeed earlier. Because the problem is a failure is still a failure. And there's a lot of rhetoric around, well, it's not really a failure. You've learned something. Okay, fine. You've learned something. But might have been. maybe there was a better way to learn that other than running an experiment and failing. Oh, well, that's not something that consultants want to talk about, right? Um, but the reality is, is that maybe we didn't need to to have that failure to begin with. Could have been a little bit smarter about this. So the real challenge is at the second, uh, the second procedure. So if we get better at that, if we get better at identifying potential techniques to experiment with, if we can get better at identifying what will work for us in our situation, then we'll have more successes. We'll have fewer failures and we'll improve faster and, and it'll be cheaper. So, how do you do that? Well, if you have access to an experienced coach, then, you know, as Mark was saying earlier, they can, they can help you out. They can provide good guidance. But do you have access to such coaches? Can you afford them? Can you identify them? Can you keep them? Do they ha actually have experience in the issues that you're about to face? I don't know. Another strategy, which works phenomenally well with coaching, um, so combine the two, uh, is if you have access to a process knowledge base, such as the DA Toolkit, you can learn how to make better decisions yourself. You, with a little bit of humility, if you understand that you more than likely face, that your teams sit, face situations today 
that are in fact very similar to situations that have been faced by other teams, often hundreds or thousands before you, and they've addressed these challenges. If you have the humility to recognize that, then maybe you could choose to leverage the learnings of those other teams and have a jump on actually fixing the problem because you, can, because you know, oh, well, yeah, that strategy is probably gonna work for us. Let's experiment with that one. Um, so this is, the, this is the entire idea. And this is something we call guided continuous improvement. So with, with this, so we've seen that adopting a framework enjoys a productivity curve that looks like this. You know, we see a we see that uh, that you know we have a seven to twelve percent productivity increase by adopting the methods and frameworks, which is great. But you peak out with those. You you hit the limits of the frameworks, uh, as Igor Yakuzin likes to say. You end up in method jail. Um, with continuous improvement, those organizations enjoy a, an improvement curve that looks like this. With guided and continuous improvement, they enjoy the same basic curve, but it's steeper because there's fewer failures. They're improving more, you know, they have more successes, they improve faster. And this is what Discipline Agile can help you to do. So our philosophy is to start where you are. So if you're currently doing safe, great, we can help you improve on safe. If you're currently doing scrum, great, we can help you improve on scrum. If you're currently doing, you know, a traditional approach, you're fairly new to Agile, great, we can help you with that. Um, because Discipline Agile is a hybrid. It's all about running uh, coherent experiments that are most likely to succeed and to, to, to improve your processes over time. So do the best in the situation that you face. And I know you're doing that, you're professionals, you're, you're doing that naturally, but always strive to get better. Always be experimenting, always be trying to get better. Um, that's our philosophy and I, I hope you choose to, uh, to adopt it. So how, I, I'm gonna very quickly go through a couple of examples and then we're gonna uh, go to questions. So how do we do that? Well, you know, earlier we saw Explore Scope. Um, so I said, you know, we've, we've organized team agility into a collection of process goals, explore scope being one of them. So how do you use the toolkit? Well, say we have a, an issue around how we're interacting with our stake, our customers and our potential customers trying to understand what they want. If we have reasonable business analysis experience in the team, then this goal diagram is probably enough of a reminder to say, oh yeah, I, I remember this technique. We should try, we should experiment with this technique because, you know, I did this on a project a few years ago and I just forgot about it. But now and I look at the diagram now I remember, let's experiment with that. But let's say we don't have that level of uh, knowledge on our team because, you know, we're not, we're only human. We're not perfect. Right. So we, we realize, you know what, we got a problem with the way, the way that we're exploring usage. So let's dive down. Let's do a little bit of reading. So we dive into the toolkit. Um, earlier, we were showing pictures of, of the printed book. Um, but we have this material online as well, free of charge at PMI.org and a tool called the, the DA browser. So we use the browser to navigate the diagram. We dive down into some more details. So each of the techniques, so you don't need to memorize 1600 techniques. I haven't, <laughs> I couldn't, <laughs> my brain's not that big. Um, I just couldn't do it, uh, but I can read. So uh, what happens is we've captured, each, we describe each of these techniques, the couple paragraphs, enough to let you know what they're all about. We also put them to context. We describe the trade-offs. What's, what's good about this technique? What's not so good about this technique to give you a feel for when you might want to use it. And there's also references. So, you know, we, we link to articles and blogs and books and, you know, uh, videos and, and, and other things to, so you can dive down to the next level of detail. I'm not showing that here, but, but we do. So we can do a little bit of reading. We can say, hey, you know what, personas, this is probably the technique that we should experiment with right now because it sounds like it's going to solve our problem and it sounds like we could pull this off. So let's experiment with this and see if it works for us in our situation so we can make better uh, process improvement decisions. So how do we accelerate this? Well, it's not just about teams. And obviously improving in your team is a, is a very important thing. But it, what's more interesting is improving across teams in getting... Uh, agile out of the IT ghetto and to really, you know, help make your businesses uh, become more, more agile, become agile enterprises. So in this scenario, the PMO comes along and he says, we need to release new, new offerings to market faster. You know, let's you know, start making more money. The product management folks, they say, yeah, that's a great idea. Um, we could release minimum business increments, these small chunks of, of value um, on a regular basis rather than big releases. Um, that way we can get more stuff in the hands of our customers faster and uh, adjust accordingly, all that good sort of stuff. 
Well, the PMO comes back and says, yeah, you know what? But we fund projects. We don't fund new features. That's no good. Uh, the release management folks, they say, yeah, we'd love to support a, a quicker release cadence. Releasing small things in a production is a far less risky for us than releasing big chunks of stuff. We'd love to do that. But sadly, the data people, it takes them three months to do anything. The data folks, they come back and they say, well, data is different. We need to think through everything up front. Agile doesn't apply to us because we're special. That, by the way, folks, is a complete and utter nonsense. But anyways, um, continuing on here. And then, of course, the PMO comes back and they say, well, yes, but we need to release new, new offerings to market faster. So we're, here we have this circular um, finger pointing thing going on. So how do we improve across this? Because the challenge is, is we've got multiple teams here. They need to work together. And the reality is, is it wouldn't be just four teams. Um, you know, potentially everybody in this value stream would need to improve. But, you know, let's keep it at four because um, that's what I can fit on a slide. <laughs> so anyways, what we need to do is negotiate a potential changes across these four areas that fit together that we believe will potentially work in our situation for us. So we need to do, we need to agree on how we're gonna to collaborate together more effectively in order to pull off this new idea of releasing to the marketplace more, uh, more quickly, more often. Um, so that's the, that's the basic idea here. So we can use the toolkit to work across these disparate teams. And notice how you know, none of these are really about software development. It's really about other aspects of the organization working together more effectively. So as coaches, we need to have this better understanding of the entire organization and where, you know, how it all fits together and all that sort of stuff. And this is the fundamental challenge that you face. You need to look at the bigger picture. And sometimes the bigger picture is not pretty. Uh, you know, I, you know I, I picked on the data management folks there a while ago, but uh, the reality is, is they face some unique challenges and uh, they can, in fact, be far more agile than they usually are, um, but they need help doing it. And, uh, and yet still they need to fulfill their, their task of protecting the organization's data and making it available and all that good sort of stuff. So it, it's hard. And uh, you know these simplistic 13 page guides don't get the job done. So to wrap up here, um, Discipline Agile helps you to improve your effective, effectiveness regardless of what you're doing. It's not safe versus DA or less versus DA or scrum versus DA, but it really is safe plus DA, less plus DA, scrum plus DA. Uh, and so on. It, you, know, you know, whatever it is that you're doing today, how do you improve and get better from there? Um, and that's perfectly fine. That's what you need to do. So successful agile organizations take responsibility for evolving their own agility. So you don't want to copy Spotify. You don't want to adopt the Spotify method. And, and don't get me wrong, it's a great method, but you want to become a Spotify. Spotify is a learning organization. They constantly improve. They constantly get better. That's what you want to do. So you can learn more about Discipline Agile. Um, you know, so we do, you know, like I said, we're a not-for-profit um, and we do offer uh, training and certification in Discipline Agile because you, know, you do need to learn to, um, you, you want to learn the, you know, how to navigate the toolkit. So we have four levels of certification, the, the DA Scrum Master, and it's about far more than being a Scrum Master. Um, it, arguably it's, this is misnamed, but um, you know, this is where you learn the fundamentals of the toolkit and how to navigate and how to improve be involved at team level improvement and individual level improvement. The senior scrum master cert helps you to lead improvement at the team level. Um, the uh, DA coach helps you to lead improvement across disparate teams. So how do we get a handful of teams working together more effectively? And the value stream consultant really does teach you how do we improve across value streams, across the organization and deal with these multi-team uh, issues and to, to, to improve the over, overall flow of the way that we work. So, um, and one thing I'll add, Scott, if you don't mind going back to the previous slide, is that um, this really is a career progression that you don't see in, in other training programs. You, uh, we, we constantly run into um, CSMs or SPCs that have been doing the same thing for 10 years <laughs> and they're still getting paid what they were 10 years ago. They're not getting recognized for their additional experience and knowledge. And what we did when we designed this certification program is really designed a progressive program so that you build on your expertise and people can quickly see that you're not one of the million scrum masters. You actually have significant knowledge 
beyond what you learn in a typical scrum course. Um, and the, the other thing I would tell you is that like it, when you look at the DA coach, that's an enterprise coach. That's not a team coach that you learn the skills to go into marketing, to go into finance, to go into yeah. PMOs and help them to become agile as well, because it's those supporting areas sometimes that aren't agile that can become impediments. So let's turn those impediments into enablers of your agility. <clears throat> and you can do that through good coaching. And those are the things you learn about in the DA coach program. Okay, Scott. All right, thank you. So I think we've got time for one or two questions, I hope. so. Yeah, Scott, I, I'm looking at the Q&A right now, and um, I, I see it, I did answer one already, so it's told people how to access the uh, DA browser. Um, one, a very interesting uh, comment here is PMI is being perceived, has been perceived more of a traditional project management than Agile. With introduction promotion of certifications of the DA toolkit, has this been changing? That is a brilliant question. <laughs> um, one of the slides that, that I, I sometimes put into my presentations is um, it talks about, take another look at PMI. It's not what you think it is. PMI has long 50 year old company, not for profit, the expert in traditional project management. Um, Arguably, the reason that the Agile Manifesto was written was a rebellion against traditional project management. But I would encourage you to take a look at the new PMI. And there's a reason that Scott and I and Disciplined Agile joined P PMI, this worldwide not-for-profit company, is to you know take a position in the Agile space. And by the way, we're well recognized by Gartner as the leading uh, Agile toolkit the only one really that is agnostic, pragmatic, recognize, recognizes that context counts and choice is good. Um, how nice to have a collection of practices that you can use to design your ways of working. You know, everybody talks about, we have to adopt new ways of working. You, you can't attend a talk these days without people talking about new ways of working. You know what? what though they don't tell you what those ways of working are <laughs> we do <laughs> we, we lay it out for you and say in this situation if you're building a brand new app then maybe you do this if you're implementing sap well maybe you do this um, if you're building software for medical devices mm, maybe you need to do this and this as well uh, nobody else really gives you those choices so i i, I think our, our our comment is it's not the pmi you think it is um, we, 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 we are now a leader in the agile space. So don't get focused on the project management aspect of it. Uh, if you want to do traditional projects, we've got that and get your PMP. If you want to take an agile first approach, then take a look at the DA toolkit. Um, yeah. so uh, and, keep it open. Go ahead, Scott. Yeah. And we're far more comprehensive too. Um, so, so for example, you know, earlier I was talking about data management and you saw the, you know, the gold diagram for data management. There's far more to the, the, you know, the process play than just the, the um, gold diagram, but where else are you going to go for uh, advice about data management? None of, none of the frameworks want to talk about data. It's, that's an ugly topic. They don't just, they just don't talk about it. They wave their hands. Oh yeah, yeah, data, whatever. Um, but they give you no advice. There's no help there. Um, so, and same thing for uh, procurement, uh, for, you know, for the vendor management stuff, and we're all struggling with these issues, right? So, and we really do need to address, you know, how do these other groups, um, you know, the non-software development groups in your organization, how do they work and how do they, how can they get better? How can they improve? Uh, because many of you work in organizations where, you know, the finance folks, they're still following traditional ways of, of finance. They're doing annual budgets. Can you imagine? Um, it's crazy, but they're still doing it. Um, and so they need help. They can improve. They can get better. Um, but, you know, we, but we can't just, you know, here, read this 13 page document. Ah, that's not going to work. You know, take this two day, um, you know, certification course that teaches you how to, how to manage meetings. That's not going to help. Um, you know, we need to do better. We, we, we do Scott. And, and, and what we find folks is that, um, when people open, see the, one of the problems is exposure as Scott and I are a little company from Canada and the way our marketing was speaking at conferences like this uh, no marketing organization um, writing books and speaking at conferences and doing social media that was all we had because we were a tiny little Canadian company now that we're part of a worldwide 
company with 300 chapters around the world, people are getting exposed to the DA toolkit and they're like, where have you been? <laughs> I've needed this for so long. So I would encourage you all to, to get involved, learn about it because um, it's like the best kept secret. What's not to like about agnosticism, not rather than dogmatic, uh, dogmatic approaches and, and choice and flexibility and learning more options so that you can optimize your ways of working, not what you know some methodologist wrote about in some book. <laughs> That's a great starting point. But you, as Scott said, you need to take responsibility for optimizing your way of working. And if you don't know what your options are, you're going to struggle. You'll get there over time. But meanwhile, your competitors are eating your lunch. <laughs> so uh, I mean, we'd encourage you to take a look at the toolkit. It, it really is um, a nice body of knowledge. Okay. okay. I think great. we're at time. Well, yeah, I think yeah, uh, we are over time. Thank, Thank you, everyone. everyone. And have a good day ahead, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.